So rate limiters are essential to keep any product stable and away from abuse. And GitHub, like any other company, did the same. But when they implemented their rate limiter using Redis, they saw pretty weird but interesting behavior. In this video, we understand how they implemented the rate limiter and go in depth about what happened, why it happened, and how they fixed it. Stay tuned till the end, and I promise you will learn something amazing today. And if you love diving deep into engineering nuances like me, you will absolutely love my courses. All of them take no nonsense, no fluff approach and are aimed at making you a better engineer and helping you accelerate your career. Instead of just scratching the surface, we go in depth into the implementation nuances of all the systems we discuss and build quick prototypes to make good design decisions. All the details about my courses can be found in the description down below. So do check them out. And now let's resume. So the initial setup of GitHub's rate limiter was powered by Memcache and they in it a single Memcache cluster present in a single data center powered their entire caching use cases as well as their rate limiting use cases. Now, when you have two cases that are two use cases that are being powered from a single infrastructure, obviously there is a problem. Now, one of the key problem that they faced is when the amount of data that was being cached by their application use cases increased your cache typically evicts the key and memcache accidentally evicted the keys that were used for rate limiter now this would lead to a lot of discrepancies and inconsistencies in the user experience so this was problem number one another problem is what they wanted is they wanted to move out of so initially when github started obviously a lot of stuff was present in a single data center and as they scaled their stuff moved across multiple data centers. But at this stage, they had a single memcache cluster. So application servers present across different data centers used to connect to memcache server present in that one data center. Obviously, they wanted to move and have a single memcache server per data center. Now, when this happens, which means you need to do sharding of, app, of application servers as well as memcache cluster, that's why what they went with, they said that, hey, now, it's time for us to re-architect our rate limiting use case and evaluate if there is a better alternative, which is where they stumbled upon. And obviously, like everybody knows the most common implementation of rate limiter is by using Redis. So they hop along the bandwagon and switch to Redis for following reasons. Reason number one is they wanted a simple sharding and replication setup. To be honest, Redis has one of the easiest way to shard the data and, rep and create replicas out of it. It's pretty easy to set up. Second is their application can shard and route the request to the right Redis node. Now, this is the best part of it. Now, when you are typically sharding your Redis across multiple data nodes, now what they, as per their architecture, they are letting their API servers decide to which Redis node should it connect to for a particular rate limiting key. Let's say if I'm rate limiting by user ID, then my cache key, or sorry, then my rate limiting key becomes user ID. And I would know using any algorithm, hash based routing, consistent routing, pick your favorite and to which Redis node should I connect to present in which data center and whatnot. So they are preferring an application level sharding to and to a way to determine which Redis node to connect to. Third reason is they have like because Redis makes it, e makes it very easy to create replicas out of master nodes. So have a replica for each shard to handle large amount of reads because remember for every single API request that comes to GitHub, you need to check for rate limits. So given that it's a very read heavy use case. So ha having an easy way to create uh, read, read replicas out of data nodes or database nodes makes your life very easy. Fourth is they, because Redis has an inbuilt TTL. So they wanted to leverage it to do auto expiration of keys, making it easier for them to uh, do the cleanups of the dead cache keys or dead rate limiting keys that they were having right? and fifth because redis supports complex lua scripts so, or sorry they supports lua scripts which means you can write complex business logic and execute it atomically inside redis that's the best part of it right? now given this it was obvious that they had to use redis and they moved it but obviously no company moves everything in one go so they were doing staggered releases Something interesting happened. So they released to a few people, uh, went well, they increased the percentage and then they started seeing some interesting behavior. And now we'll do a deep dive on what this bug is and it's 
pretty fascinating to be honest. So let's understand what happened. The issue is wobbling. Now what is wobbling here? So what GitHub does, GitHub to be honest has one of the best usage or uh, one of the best ways to uh, an API server can send you the response. If you look at the headers that it sends, it is a gold mine of information. We'll focus on the rate limiting headers. So whenever you make an API call to GitHub, in the response, in the HTTP response that you get, you get rate limiting headers that tells you after this API call, what is the remaining rate limit that you have at spare. For example, let's say you make this curl request, curl hyphen I to get all the details of headers and all. HTTPS api.github.com slash user slash octocat. Make any API call to anything. Apart from the regular response that you get, the HTTP headers that you get, the rate limiting headers is what we are focusing on are x rate limit limit x rate limit remaining and so on and so forth now here the header that is of our interest is x rate limit reset now by default if you do not pass any uh, any authentication token or any user specific information the rate limit is per hour so here it says that i have total 60 requests that i can make in an hour 59 of them are remaining because one has been just consumed then my rate limit will reset at this time this is epoch timestamp my rate limit will reset at this time so i literally tried this today today is 15th august 15th august 1 117 is when i made that api request uh, my first api request and i could get in response this time which is 2 17 45 pm ist 15th august 2024 right so this tells you that it resents the exact time at which your rate limit will reset. That's the time it sends. And this is the header of our rate because this is what's going to wobble. Then it says rate limit resource and rate limit used, so on and so forth. Right? Now, what is wobbling here? The rate limit reset header is wobbling. So it showed 172371665 at one moment. Then the next moment it showed triple six like double six six and then it moved back to double six five so this wobbling is what concerned a lot not a lot of but a few of github's heavy user because they were relying on this header to do certain operations they uh, documented the error shared it with the github team github team started navigating or started uh, investigating the issue and the ideal behavior would have been that no matter what happens, the value should always be 172371165. That's what it should be. Like until that next one hour happens, the value should not change. Obviously, because why it should wobble. Right? That is the ideal behavior. Now, what caused this wobble? And this is where you would absolutely love on what happens where you know every second matters. Now we'll go deeper into this. So <clears throat> How does, how is GitHub using Redis? We'll start with that and then we'll go deeper into why the issue happened. We'll look at the happy path and then we'll look at the edge case. So upon every request that GitHub gets, it fires a Lua script on Redis that basically adjusts the, all the counters that it needs to do against a rate limit key. So if you're rate limiting by user, you would have a key specific to that user against which a bunch of counters would be stored and it updates the counter that one key used or rather one API request is used, 59 remaining, reset time is this. Now when this Lua script is fired, it, it not only updates the counter, but it also returns the TTL, which is the amount of time left in that key to be auto expired. That's what it sends. Now this is what is then sent back to the user in the x rate limit reset header but if you observe reset does not send a delta it's the absolute time at which the key will expire so what happens is when your request goes to your github api server github server, github api server fires the lua script on redis gets the ttl now on this server it adds time dot now plus ttl sets it in the reset header and responds back to the user this is where the problem starts to creep in. So the root cause is that the time actually passes between you made a call to Redis and then when you are computing it over here. 
let's understand with the happy path and then you'll easily understand the edge case it's pretty fascinating now here a sm small and quick disclaimer i'm using smaller numbers like thousand to help you understand but in reality these are all epoch timestamp in seconds right but i'm just using smaller number because it makes it easier for me to explain now here uh, we have two actors api server and redis now let's say what happens at timestamp 1000 at timestamp 1000 your first request is initiated from your client obviously from your client the first request is initiated at timestamp 1000 now this request from your api server starts to redis this is where your entire lua script is fired now let's say time taken to travel from api server to redis plus execution of lua script plus returning the response and reaching it over here takes 200 millisecond right so what would happen is assume half the time so at after 100th millisecond is what your redis gets that thing at that time so 1000.1 at that time instant redis is setting the key in the database and sets the ttl to let's say five seconds hypothetically assume that my ttl is set to five seconds right now this is where what for whatever key i'm setting my ttl is set to five seconds and that executed at 1000th time so that's where at that time instant my key would be set with a ttl of five seconds and when it receives the when my api server receives the response from redis 200 total 200 millisecond have passed and what i'm doing is when it receives when it reaches back to api server i'm responding with what i'm re, i'm getting in response the ttl so i would get five in response so 1000 is my current timestamp 1000.2 plus five uh, then it is basically converted to integer and what you respond is 1005 to your user right now let's say the next request came at 800 millisecond past 1001 so 1001.8 at this timestamp the request is is the next request is initiated from your api server to your redis and now let's say this request was relatively faster and it reaches in let's say 50 millisecond right to your uh, redis server and then it executes half execution happens in 50 milliseconds so roughly the entire time entire time from api server to redis and back is let's say 100 millisecond so 1001.8 it reaches to redis now assume half the time so at 1001.85 is when that key is validated that key is checked if it is like if for this rate limit key has this user breached the rate limit or not now because there is one second passed at this stage what would be the ttl of the key here the timestamp was 1000.1 here it is 1001.85 because one second is passed the value of ttl would be 4 because we initially the ttl was set to 5 now after one second is passed the ttl would be 4 now what it would return 4 and because the total time it took was 100 millisecond from 1001.8 it become 1001.9 1001.9 plus 4 is equal to 1005 so this is what would be set in x rate limit reset header so consistent behavior no wobbling up until now right now let's look at the edge case this is where the wobbling happens now the first flow remains as is but assume that the second request got initiated at 1001.9 at 1001.9 the second request got initiated and let's say it takes total 100 milliseconds to reach back so from api server to redis back to api server now what would happen is roughly 50 minute uh, 50 milliseconds is when we assume that the ttl would be checked the ttl would be fetched and then responded back so at that time at that very time what would be the value so it reached over here 1001.95 is the time at which you are you are getting the ttl value of that key and because one second is passed the value is four right and now when it reaches back it would take another 50 millisecond so the timestamp on my api server is from 1001.9 it is now 1002 1002 the value it received is four ttl 1002 plus four 1006 so at one time your x rate limit reset header got value 1005 in the next instant it got 1006 ideally it should get always 1005 because 
the time has not yet passed right this is the edge case my god when i was going through it it took me some time to understand this edge case but it was pretty pretty fascinating on to see that where why people say in distributed system clocks are brutal a classic example of that right you cannot and this is one of the fallacies of distributed system where you cannot assume that latency is zero network latency processing time is zero right now how did they fix it now we understand why wobbling would happen and now we can see n number of cases where this wobble would happen it's not just one off case uh, n number of cases where this wobble would happen when you are breaching that time that that time part is when the wobble would happen so uh, one potential solution that you may think of is hey let me increase the precision so instead of operating at a seconds level let's say we do it at millisecond level but that would still not that would minimize the wobble but it would still not eradicate it another thing is you'd say hey instead of me computing or we computing the time at the api server the final time dot now plus ttl what if my redis itself sends it right that would make sense if we do that that was difficult to test for them and more importantly did not support versions 5 and below which some of their infrastructure components did have right so they wanted something simpler over there so what did github do now github did something very interesting so because here wobble was very problematic for their end users what they prioritize is they prioritize accuracy now where they if they are prioritizing accuracy they have to give up on something so what they did is they increased their storage footprint and they added one more key against every rate limit key that they had they added they still went with time they still went with ttl no changes there but to power the reset at header what they started doing is they started persisting reset header in the database right next to the rate limiting key they started setting another key where they held rate uh, where they held reset at which is the absolute time at which it is supposed to reset now what happens is now they are returning these two things from the lua script now this way what happens is this because this value is stable nobody is changing it you are not on runtime computing the uh, the reset at it is persisted in the database you get that value and you immediately send it so wobbling is gone ttl is still used as like i am saying ttl is still used and they set this value one second from the time that it that you basically compute to ensure that it never ever has that edge case now this is all taken again this is all taken from github's engineering blog i absolutely loved going through it their blog also contains the entire lua script it contains one more bug that they faced and how they fixed it it's very similar to this bug and i've linked it in the i card in this video so tap on the i card go through the blog you will absolutely have a blast going through it right and yeah when i read it pretty amazing stuff and i absolutely loved going through it so i hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it amusing. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot.